Good morning. Um, yeah, it's um, when Menno asked me if I would uh, come and share uh, uh, this story with you um, about this book, uh, No Straight Lines, it was actually kind of intriguing for me to kind of be asked to look back when I'd sort of been looking and thinking a lot about the future. Uh, no Straight Lines was published in 2011, and I'd actually spent about seven years um, thinking and researching very hard about um, what seemed to me to be some quite profound changes in the world that was going to affect us um, in profound ways. Um, every single one of us in, a, in this room and outside and beyond are all being challenged by what is happening. This was the thesis that I came up with, a bit dramatic. We're at the adaptive edge of our industrial society. Um, and the, actually the problem was is what I called a trilemma, this sort of, this kind of impact on our social um, and our economic and our organizational way that we get stuff done in this world. Um, and the, in many ways what we faced was, is a, was a design challenge. And in fact, actually, if you just look at this list uh, up on the, uh, on, on the wall here, I think we could probably all agree that uh, whether we're looking at business or healthcare, education, our urban environment, um, the intense discussion and debate about migration um, and our cultural context, and of course in Britain at the moment we're having this ridiculous conversation about whether we're going to stay or not stay in the EU, all built around economics and immigration and migration. Um, we, I think, have finally accepted that our climate is uh, changing, and of course, actually, that then has huge issues around our food security. And that's why, in many ways, No Straight Lines was looking at the challenges we had from a sort of systemic uh, level, rather than taking one particular area and saying, we're just going to look at this, the um, picture of the silo that Menno showed me, um, you know, uh, made me smile. Because in many ways, you know, we are taught uh, to think and work sometimes perhaps in too siloed a fashion. And of course, in a way, that's the sort of organizational design of all of these things which are here. And which is why I said, in a way, you know, we have arrived at a point where from a linear perspective, the way that we think about what we make and how we make it, the way that we get stuff done together, we can no longer be effective and efficient in the current paradigm that we are working in. So what did I predict? Well, I kind of looked at the reality that uh, with the onset of digital technology, because in many ways it's always technology that allows us to push and pull levers to bring profound change into the world to challenge uh, monopolies or establish world orders, that we were going to start to sort of be looking at some of these things, greater global reach, greater customization, reduced barriers to entry, the end of scale, and easier entry into adjacent markets. Just think about some of the companies that uh, Menno and his colleague were sharing with you earlier today, and I think you can see that those things are actually are a reality. They're not predictions anymore. But equally, we were seeing things like greater innovation. I mean, our world, for me, you know, has been dominated. I think in 2009, I was talking to a friend of mine that started up one of the early tech accelerators in England. And now, actually, if you think about it, you know, there is not a single, you know, city, uh, town, country which is just not awash with um, innovation startups, innovation warehouses, talking about entrepreneurialism and entrepreneurship. Access to greater information transparency. Think about the complexity and design of organizations. But there's an increased competition. And, of course, what we see is massive disruption of existing markets. On top of that, what we see is, is what we call adaptive technologies. So think about 3D printing. Um, we're thinking about bioengineering. If we think about actually how technology is allowing us to fundamentally change the way that things get made, that's having a profound effect on our world. Flexible manufacturing and what we call co-evolved customers. All of these things are happening to us right now. But I also talked about the organization as a platform. 
this idea that rather than having a sort of a, a design of a company or a business that was fixed, um, there was ways in which that company could create um, the means by which other organizations or people or information could actually start to plug into it and actually have a sort of a mutual value interchange uh, where actually money, information, ideas, whatever, were starting to flow and create business and capability and capacity in different ways. And I talked about openness. Nature thrives because she is open. And one of the things that I was seeing, again, whether it was in education or whether it's in healthcare or whether it is in business, those organizations that increasingly wanted to live in a closed monopoly were the ones that tended to die. If you think about Elon Musk recently releasing the patents for his battery technology um, under a fair use Creative Commons license, this was someone that was actually saying, by releasing that information into the world, rather than me hanging on to it, other people can come and start to build and create that ecosystem. He understood in many ways that that was the form of stimulation that really gives life to an entirely different industry. You know, even five years ago, we would not have been able to have imagined that electric cars in the way that Elon sees them could actually be fundamental to the way that we are going to be driving anywhere and everywhere in the world, that fossil fuels, that the combustion engine was always going to be dominant. So I also talked about the collaborative economy and the way that actually we would come together to start to share um, in a mutual way value, the way that we would create business. And in fact, Alan Rushbridger, who was the editor of the Guardian newspaper, said that mutuality was now a business strategy of the Guardian as a media company. So open, what does it mean? Well, open innovation, open legal frameworks like the periodic table published here uh, under a Creative Commons license, giving people the possibility to share and use that. Open data, open APIs, open business models, the open organization and open source. Philosophically, organizationally, um, and from an application point of view, a completely different way in terms of how we think we build organizations and businesses now and into the future. Even in places like science, we're seeing this idea of openness becoming extremely important. So from an infrastructure perspective, platforms and tools allowing scientists to actually share knowledge and information in very different types of ways. Democratically, so that in fact there is a call here in Holland that all science research should be available free to scientists and the general public by I think 2025. And also from a collaborative perspective, the idea that in fact, working on your own in a research center where your information is only available to you, people now are starting to come together to work collaboratively on science-based research projects because they understand actually that the pooling and sharing of that knowledge and information allows the rapid acceleration of discovery and the ability then to apply that in the world that we live in. And I talked about data. Data being the interface of the intention economy. But of course, the interesting thing is, is that what we've discovered in the last few years is that there's lots of people that has lots of intention about your data. Whether that's the NSA or GCHQ or other um, you know, organizations connected to governments that are hoovering up your data and using it to monitor you, or whether that's third parties that are interested in taking your data and selling it to other people to make money, we see that data has become almost, this sort of, almost as important as breathing the oxygen around us. So data has become a very, very important part of our daily lives. So what does that all mean? Well, in a sense, this is what I meant from being going from a linear to a non-linear world. We have a company like Kodak, you know the story extremely well. Um, and then a company comes along called Instagram and very quickly actually has a huge valuation. I think only has something like, had at the time, 16 employees. 
and changes the way that we think about taking photographs and sharing them and uploading them. Airbnb is a platform. Um, if you fancy staying in this place, you can. It's on a lake in Iceland. And Airbnb is actually valued at $24 billion. We see the massive acceleration of artificial, artificial intelligence and IoT or connected devices or machine-to-machine -machine learning. These are all of the things that are, have become very hot topics uh, in the last 12 months. And of course, what we see is the drop-off of friction. So what's kind of interesting to me is actually after the global financial crisis um, that started in 2008 really kicked in in the next 24 months of that, and we went into this world of lockdown, of hanging on, the, trying to keep business as usual. In England, we had the language of austerity. But the reality is the pace of technology uh, progress never, ever stops. And all of a sudden, we're in this completely different world where this technology is profoundly impacting and changing our lives and our world. So actually, everything that we thought had happened is now happening. Um, in fact, actually, I was seeing a, a video online just the other day about robots which can actually count the number of apples or pears or fruit in a tree, can decide when will be absolutely the right time to pick them. And I think about the agricultural industry and actually within the next five years or maybe a decade at the most, how that will profoundly change people's lives and the jobs that people have as a consequence of that. And of course we have you know, the ubiquitous so-called unicorn companies, Uber being one of them. What I would like to say here for me in many ways is I get, I get very upset um, or concerned, I suppose this is my, my rage, Menno, um, where people celebrate a company like Uber. Yes, probably there is a need for a better taxi service in some parts of the world, but the reality is the way that Uber is behaving is, to me, unethical and unacceptable. They're being driven by VCs which aren't really interested in people's lives, and in fact, the reality is, is that in a few years' time, Uber will be very happy having a fleet of driverless cars. So again, you see an entire industry potentially will be on its knees and die. That to me is a way of not building a business. That's the way of not bringing value into the world. It's a very personally held perspective. It's a very strongly held perspective. But I felt that to me, it's very important that we share this and have this debate because if everything is in flux, and we have the opportunity to actually redesign and recreate pretty much everything around us at the moment, then we need to be asking a really important question, which is why? Why are we doing it? And what value do we bring to the world? I've written another book, which has just been published, which um, is called Do Design, Why Beauty is Key to Everything. And actually, in a recent um, workshop that I was doing uh, with Delft University here in um, uh, Holland just a couple of weeks ago, this came up as part of the conversation from the researchers. Trust creates beauty. So we have the opportunity to actually start to think about how we can create things where trust is really sort of baked into the, sort of the DNA and the hardware of the businesses and organizations we're going to create. Because I also believe this that trust and the free exchange of ideas fuel sustainable economies. Think about Elon Musk and Tesla and the release of his you know, hard-won patent technology and sharing that to the world. That's an act of trust. And that's why the blockchain, for me, is really important. Everyone in this room know what the blockchain is? No? Right, okay. The blockchain is as important to your lives as Tim Berners-Lee inventing the World Wide Web um, and the invention of DNA. Essentially, it is a ledger which cannot be broken, and it initially started with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, where ownership of something can be written into a piece of code that can never, ever be changed. And it will change the way we think about money. It will change the way that banks will work. It may even get rid of banks as we currently know them today. 
So when Bloomberg and The Economist start putting the blockchain onto their front covers, you know that actually this should be something that we should be looking at very closely. So they talk about the blockchain being a trust-making engine. And it's something I think that I will predict that companies that come to the fore and will endure and survive in this growth of innovation and entrepreneurship will be ones that actually, as I said, hardwire and bake in trust to their businesses. You know, think about the loss of value of Volkswagen because of the lying and the, at the industrial scale of their emissions so they could sell more cars. You can never get that trust really back. It could well be that our identities will be connected to the blockchain. So I think over the next 10 to 15 years, blockchain technology will start to play a key role in many aspects of our lives and industries and organizations so that we know that we can trust absolutely whatever it is that is happening to us. Greater competitive intensity was one of the things that I talked about. And there's a company in Japan, it's 30, oh, sorry, in China, called Hire, and they make um, white goods. They make fridges and washing machines and television sets and all sorts of things. But in fact, the CEO has decided about a radical redesign of that company. This is how a company used to work, siloed, hierarchical, top-down, with the customers as a kind of like an addendum on the end. And if you remember, I talked about the relationship of co-evolved customers and customization and greater flexibility and adaptive technologies. And they have a mantra, which is, if you're going to change things, you might as well disrupt yourself to survive rather than wait for somebody else to come and do it to you first. And they also talk about the zero distance between the company and the customer. So this is the new model. This is really what Menno uh, is talking about at this conference, about the unorganization. These are people which are, aren't paid employees salaries, they are paid for the value that they bring to their customers. They bring their customers into the process. They think about completely different ways about how that organization works. And they do this because they want to create better products for their customers at a higher value. The CEO decided he said, no longer do I wish to produce cheap, poorly made, poorly performing objects and products and services for my company and for our customers. Interestingly enough, they have an unmanned factory, completely automated. But if you're buying a higher washing machine, you can get an app for your mobile phone and you can customize it via this. And that information then is sent to the factory. Another example is healthcare. Now, normally what happens is if you go to your GP is doctor speaks and patient listens. And let me sort of you know, invite you to do this. Next time you go to your GP and you see all of those notes, uh, which are your medical history, when you get up to leave, go to take them. And the doctor will say, what do you think you're doing? And you'll say, well, that's my data. That's my information. Surely I just should know all about that. And they'll look at you as though you're mad. And it's one of the problems that we've got is actually healthcare is one of the biggest costs to any westernized economy. Again, we're having huge debates in the UK about our free NHS. In many ways, people are believing that the government is trying to sell it off because it doesn't really know how to manage it anymore, thinking that privatization will work better. But it doesn't really solve the design problem of what you do with, in this instance, chronic health care. So patients knows best. What it says is, if the patient has access to the same amount of information as the clinical team, operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a secure environment, that patient will then be in control of their health care. This is now established in a number of key hospitals in the UK. 
And what it's proven is, sorry, I'll go back, is that it, by empowering patients, it reduces wrong diagnosis and saves clinical time. Again, all you're doing is, is redesigning the organization so that people are co-evolved, they're collaborative, they're sharing knowledge and information which you previously could not have done in what I would describe as a linear system. And Topcoder is a company in the US which actually runs competitions around trying to solve um, coding problems for companies. As you can see uh, up here, they've got a million members, they run 7,000 challenges a year, and there's already been $80 million paid to their community. One of their large clients was NASA. NASA said, we have a problem with our medical kit. Um, the algorithm we can't crack. Uh, we've got our best people on it, we can't do it. So with Topcoder, they put up a competition where I think the, the fee was around about $2 million, described the competition, and gave a time period in which actually people needed to solve that problem. People from around the world can come to Top Coder. People can actually hang out with the best coders in a kind of peer-to-peer -peer network. And they run all sorts of types of different types of competitions, sometimes which are a bit like kind of practicing, and some like the NASA thing, which are big and real and very serious. But they're bringing huge value to the people that need those problems solved. And if you've got access to that amount of people, no company can hold that type of knowledge in one place. It can't afford to do it. So there's a way of being open, and there's a way of being collaborative that allows us to actually start to address some really big and pressing problems in ways which the old model would never have allowed us to do. And just thinking about democracy, um, there's a company uh, or an organization in uh, the UK called 38 Degrees. Um, and of course, again, you know that, um, you can see the logo up here, the BBC is much loved in our country because it's free, it doesn't carry any adverts, and we kind of like that. Um, but there's actually lots of people um, which don't want the BBC to be around, other people which feel that uh, the BBC is too big and too powerful and all the rest of it. And so there was a white paper coming out very recently, um, and 38 Degrees um, got in touch uh, through its campaigning online um, capability, and as you can see here, 388,000 people, um, 896, uh, signed a petition and wrote to their MPs, and I was one of them. And I got a handwritten letter back from my MP, Lucy Fraser, who kind of, in a way, sort of sniffed at the fact that you know, they'd been inundated at that point by some 200,000 people from 38 degrees. And I wrote back to her and I said, you don't understand. If I had not actually had that email from 38 degrees telling me about what was going on, other than reading it in the paper, I could not respond to you. And you will notice that I wrote a very long note about how I felt so strongly about the fact that people like Rupert Murdoch should not be the most powerful media person in the UK and that we need a free BBC because for me that was important. So I made the point that in that sense, the capacity to reorganize even our democratic voices to be able to be heard and to be counted perhaps is part of this transformation that we're going on. Everything in this world, as I said, if it's man-made, is designed. There comes a point where it doesn't exist, but we have a problem. It makes us think about things. So therefore, we have to imagine it. We have to think it. We have to dream it. And then we have to find the means to make it. And if we're going to do that, then I've got this wish. Why not make it beautiful? Why not make it engaging and meaningful and restorative? And why not make it uplifting? And why not make it valuable? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.